It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Cole Brenny with PracticingDentist.com, as well as the owner of Ivory Dental Group in Minneapolis, Minnesota. One of his passions is coaching young dentists around the country to master private practice dentistry, learn the business of dentistry, and build, buy, and grow practices they love. So you're a, you're a young guy. You're 33. I'm 33. Yep. You're 33. Yep. So you're I'm I'm 30 years out of school. So you're closer, more connected to the <laughs> to the young kids that are just coming out of school the first five years. What what percent of them do you think say, you know, I, I don't want to work that hard, know my own business. I just want to be employed my whole life. Versus how many of them do you think still have a dream that one day they will own their own? Well, well, here's the thing. I mean, I love. I love dental ownership, practice ownership. My dad was a, is a dentist and he taught me the value of being your own boss, but I'm a millennial dentist too. So I see, you know, the, I'm definitely part of the unique landscape that, and problems that we face. And, you know, I think to answer your question, it's more so that, that young dentists, I think, don't know what they want to do. I think we get out, um, you know, dental school doesn't really set us up for, for private practice ownership success. So we get out and we've got a ton of debt and, Nobody will hi- nobody's going to hire us as new dentists because we haven't gotten any, any specialty training. We have zero experience. And then we're thrown out into the world and, and the only buddy that hires us are, are corporate, <laughs> corporate dental office. So we work there for a while. And then many of us don't ever, ever experience a quality private practice. And it, it becomes the less scary thing just to stay status quo. So that's, that's, a, that's my take of the, this, the current state of things. But I think there's a lot of young dentists that want to be practice owners and that's a dream and I, that's my dream and hope for most most all young dentists um but yeah it's hard i mean we get out and you get out and you never you never do molar endo because they get sent out you never really get to do any ortho you don't get to do any surgery and you get stuck for five six seven eight years at you know corporate and then it's easier just to stay there because you forgot what what private practice was ever like or you never experienced it at all so it's interesting it's a good question you know um a lot of my uh, friends from uh, class of 87 UMKC, we talk about how when we were in school, there were six full-time endodontic instructors. And now some of these dental schools are bigger and they only have one. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, we did, I think, I, when I went back to teach, I was at, I stopped once I started practicing dentists a couple years ago, but I was teaching for about four or five years. And when I graduated, we did, it was good if you did one molar endo. I mean, you got out, you did one molar endo, maybe you did a couple surgical extractions, you know, and that's the problem at, at, I I love the U of M, it's a great school, but, you know, for a general dentist, which I'm a super big advocate for, uh, practice owner, dental school right now, and that's why I do this, that's why I teach, that's why I built Practicing Dentist, is to help new dentists and new new, new potential owners at least bridge the gap or, or make it less scary have someone come alongside them and be a resource so they can actually get the questions answered that they need to. Cause, cause yeah, the trajectory trajectory is less practice ownership and, and more corporate. So, which isn't and, bad if that's what you want, but. And, and you know, that's what uh, corporate is uh, doing so well. I mean, I think it's funny how so many dentists complain about corporate yet their mm-hmm. office sits there 168 hours a week and they're only open 32 hours a week. Their phones ringing off the wall when they're closed Friday, Saturday, Sunday evenings. And they don't hire any of these kids and they right. can hire them and mentor them and do all this stuff. They don't want to do any of that. But gosh darn, uh, when corporate rolls into town, hires all these kids, all they'll do is complain and whine about that. <laughs> you know, well, it's so. interesting. It's interesting. Cause I, I, I totally get it. We're, we're downtown. We have corporate all, all around us, but it's not, it, honestly, I see them as two different entities. And I think I've heard you say that too. It's like, well, if you set your practice up, right, you're a completely different, flavor or option for your patients than corporate practice would be but you know you just have to see how to execute it i guess so when did you when did you start your uh uh podcast and and uh you're uploading that on the dental town uh app so if you're uh commuting to work and uh um i'm so i i started podcasting um i think it's like the 800 show like 800 days ago because we <laughs> needed to start that uh section on dental town but dental yeah. town is uh, dental town. It's not Howard Fran, and and it's a user generated content site. And I'm so excited now. There's 39 people in dentistry uploading podcasts. So if you're driving to work, um, you know, open up that uh, dental town app, and you can see uh, uh, you you go to dental town, 
And then on the lower right-hand col column is these um, three horizontal bars, and it says more. And then there's the podcast. And uh, so what? when did you start podcasting? And, and tell us about that journey. Yeah, you know, so I'm a millennial dentist. So that means, you know, technology is pretty integrated into my, my whole life and our whole lives. And, um, you know, when I started teaching it, the whole idea was keep things short and sweet, short videos, things you can download, relevant topics that are specific to the problems new dentists and new practice owners face. And podcasts just kind of evolved as I did that because I do my most of my teaching is short videos and simple downloadable guides. But podcasts are nice because I can involve other experts, you know, other dentists. And with the it's the podcast is called um, the Dental CEO Podcast: Dentistry in the Real World. And the whole point of it is just to interview other dentists or experts um, to have just real world conversations. The, the whole thing with this podcast, I started doing it maybe a year ago just because there was a demand for it. And it's a fun way to, to involve more people in teaching. Um, you know, it, it just, it just took off. I mean, I think everyone, everyone's listening to them, especially young dentists, um, dental students, new dentists, like you said, going to work, pop in your earbuds and listen to somebody or, or listen to a conversation about maybe something that you don't know quite well. So I love it. Podcast, super fun, super easy. So what is the exact name of the show? It's called the Dental CEO Podcast, Dentistry in the Real World. And you can also get to it from your, uh, if you go to practicingdentist.com, there's a button there where you can click. Right. I've got the podcast right on right online, or it's on iTunes too. So apparently yeah. people, I, I had comments, and you, you got to post on iTunes because apparently people love iTunes. <laughs> download it easily there right apples, yeah it's fun apple's a, a big 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 player um so what so um how are you teaching these dentists to thrive in private practice how how does uh how how is that going and how do you do it yeah so there's there's two different ways so basically that practicing dentists is built in two avenues one is new dentists so dentists that are just graduating dental school or just entering private practice so a lot of that is um, I've got uh, a CE guide I do every year, for example. I mean, a lot of it, I, I build this content off of people that dentists that have been out five, 10 years, one year that, that report back. And, and I ask, Hey guys, what are the things you wish you would, you would have been taught? And I'll put together some content on uh, and training material on those questions. So one is for new dentists. I do a, a, a course actually too. Every year we do a couple events around dental schools around the country. And so we do a, I call it the welcome to the real world course. And it's a lecture just about a lot of the questions and things that you're going to face in your first year or two that nobody maybe told you about. Um, it's pretty fun. It's pretty, pretty exciting. I think a lot of, a lot of the new dentists love it. And we do that here in Minnesota and we've got one in Iowa next year and uh, Marquette, uh, UMKC in Nebraska. Um, and then part two is dentists that are thinking about ownership because I love ownership, huge advocate. And so the idea is to, to come along one by one on one and help them navigate you know, the mist mistakes to avoid, how to set the practice up to be successful from day one, how to market it, how to build it, um, and how to put together your team. So it's just a simple one-on-one -on -one, um, help you get launched. I call it practice launch coaching. And it's just, you know, it's inexpensive. I do it because I love it. Um, just to come alongside somebody and, and have another ear voice. Because I know when, when we go out and we start practices, we start buying these boomer practices and then have to switch them over and, and add some technology and revamp them and change them around. It's it's unique and we have no, no prior experience on that. So it helps to have someone. So are most together. of your students, are they still in dental school or are they a couple of years out as an associate somewhere? Or? Graduated dental students. So I'd say the dentist just graduating. So one to one to five or six years out are most of our, most of our listeners. So every year we build more and more, they come out of dental school and then they stay tuned. We have some, uh, we have a Facebook, um, Facebook mastermind group, which is really fun. It's, it's the dentists that graduate and then we get together on Facebook and it's like a chat room. Um, and you can talk and ask questions and send cases. And so it's really relevant to that, that the problems facing you know, people one to five years out. So we talk and then when they're ready to do practice ownership, we, we kind of move on there. So it's basically that scope or that, that trajectory. Um, and then, and then they go into become owner. And what do you think the biggest barriers are biggest uh, things they're learning uh, that make them uh, go from associate to owner? I mean, what, 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 um, self like what are the challenges? beliefs or what are the challenges? What, 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 what do you think uh, they're, they're learning from you the most to make them uh, pull the trigger? 
Yeah, I mean, when I when I work or, or talk to, to new dentists, it's you know we do we do some events here in Minneapolis too for potential owners just to help them bridge the gap and and kind of uh, get questions answered because I think it's fear. There's a lot of fear around just the unknown. You know, you're working like I said in a corporate office. You have no experience with the business of dentistry um, or how to run and manage a practice because you've been working for corporate. Um, and it's hard to take the leap or you look at the debt and you worry, oh, how are the numbers going to work out? Because nobody's ever taught me about what the numbers look like. You get an appraisal back and you're wondering, well, is this a good option or not? Is this really right for me and what I what I dream for my career or not? Um, so I think fear is, is a big is the biggest roadblock, the biggest barrier from people taking the leap. Fear, definitely fear. When, um, do you recommend uh building a de novo from scratch or do you think uh, or do you counsel that they should buy existing i mean i think it depends uh, personally i i built my office so i did kind of a unique thing i think it's there's an interesting option happening now more and more with uh, boomer practices coming online because i think there's a pretty, a pretty good supply here in the next 10 years as you know people have delayed retirement are going to decide to retire and just when my dad was a dentist 1980, he, uh, he had 150 in his class. I graduated with 100. So in Minnesota, there's 50 retiring dentists now for every 100 coming back. And the problem is a lot of those now are working in corporate. So there's less people to buy them. Um, so I think I've had friends, I've had colleagues and, and people I've worked with that have started great from scratch offices and loved it. Personally, I think there's definitely a business advantage to acquiring practices and rolling them in. Um, you could do what I did was we actually we acquired a couple practices and then we built an office from scratch and simultaneously combined them, which is very difficult, but it worked really well. Um, but it's very tricky. But that was a great option. And so now we're still just acquiring more and more practices, which is great. Great way to grow. But yeah, the business the business numbers point to, you know, if you can buy a practice and make it run, make it fly, it's it's easier in it's, a lot of ways. It's easier and safer. And safer, for sure. I mean, there's and, a lot of risk. Yeah. And um, so some of those people, you know, when, when they got, you know, th three, four, five hundred thousand dollars of student loans, um, they need to actually buy a bigger practice so they can get that debt paid off in 10 years. I mean, if they right. if they start small or they'll say, well, I have so much I have three hundred fifty thousand dollars in debt, so I'm only going to buy this little practice for four fifty. And it's like, right. dude, if you got three hundred fifty thousand dollars student loans, you need to buy a million dollar practice. <laughs> So you can have massive yeah, totally. cash flow. Um, people totally. listening yeah, to podcasts um, are usually driving. So what I do with my guest is I um, retweet their last uh, tweet. I'm at Howard Foran, and you're um, at Practicing Dent on Twitter. But you haven't tweeted, so I can't retweet it. You're 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 listening <laughs> at Practicing Dent. So if you make a tweet today, um, I'll retweet it uh, to uh, it. to the. Uh, Dentist, and uh, because then then they'll just go there, and then they can uh, um, go right Check to your website. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. No, but I'm interested. So that you're, you're talking about opening practice versus buying a practice. I mean, I think I think the, one of the things I see that's interesting is is with so much debt too, people get out and they're really worried about the price of a practice and the size. And and it's funny because there's this, this phenomenon or dynamic where. You know, it's like, well, if I if I buy something cheaper, it's going to be better. And exactly off your point, what you said, that necessarily isn't the right way to think because, you know, it's like the practice, if it's a good practice, does the price really matter that much? I mean, I think there's more important things to worry about, like the size, the cash flow and, and the revenue it's generating, right? The new patient flow. Um, so that's interesting. I don't know if you've, if you've talked to people about that or, or heard that before, but I've kind of seen that now. With a lot of lot of new dentists, yeah, and and uh, I would and I there's a lot of new technology. Like a lot of these uh, practice brokers, you know, their main goal is to to sell the practice, and you can right. go in there. There's so many um, dashboards. I mean, there's so many dashboards that you can oh. uh, that you can install and uh, yeah, find totally. out all the metrics of value. And you always got to match skill. Like I I saw a kid really fail big in my backyard. Um, he bought like a million dollar practice, but the guy was a really high end cosmetic dentist and he thought he could do all those veneers and crowns, which he could, but he sure as hell couldn't sell it. Right. And so he, he bought like a 
two million dollar practice and i mean he had that thing under six hundred thousand in year one just because he didn't realize the selling doctor was just a master treatment plan presenter and selling dentistry and um and also there's a lot of hidden value in those practices like if you buy a practice and he's referring out a molar every week to an endodontist there's there's fifty thousand revenue if you can do molar endo or maybe he never placed implants or maybe he didn't do invisalign but you really got to match the skill set Right. You know, you really, so, yeah, go I like there. that. And Unlocking you, the value. And, and you also have to make quick decisions because like say when there's 50 dentists retiring from 40 years ago and the graduating class is now a hundred, it's totally a seller's market. And when these people put up a practice for sale uh, in the urban areas, uh, they're getting three or four offers that day. Some are above uh, the asking price. And uh, so if you're a uh, doctor paralysis by analysis where you want to just sit there and think about it and talk to all your friends and just dwell on it, by the time you uh ready to pull the trigger, it's gone. Right. No, I, I, we saw that personally. Actually, I have a good friend who, who we were working with. Um, yeah, and it came online and we were dealing with financing and look at the numbers and back and forth and back and forth and boom, it sold. And he was really bummed. You know, it's like it's like the housing market now. I know in Minneapolis, I'm sure Arizona is similar. Um, you know, it's like a house comes on the market here in the city. And if it, if you aren't sure of what you want, which is a good, I guess the, the, the moral of the story is know your, know your goals, have a, va- you know, have, have a, a plan for your life or your, your career and be ready to pull the trigger, right? Cause something comes online, you need to know if it's what you want or not and be ready. Um, so that's something definitely, I think that would help a lot of dentists. Is, so is who are these other dentists time. on your, uh, if you go to practicingdentist.com, there's a Dr. Lamb Two Minnesota career plan coaching, Dr. Preston Hamrick, practice coaching light, Dr. Katie Daniels. Who are all these people? Yeah. So those are clients. Those are, those are um, practicing dentist clients, people I've helped with through the coaching program. Um, so not the the new dentist program. That's that's all usually sponsored or, or free um, content. But the coaching is one on one, and it's really fun for me because it's kind of like, hey, let's meet one on one. Let's lay out your plan, help you develop a, you know, the steps to take to get to where you want to be. And it's really really customized and specific. So you know, it goes from as simple as, you know, developing a career plan to as in depth as full practice launch coaching, which is what we did with Katie. And actually, I just got off the phone with her today, and we're, we're she bought the practice. We took her through, you know, finding it to buying it, to launching it, to hiring. And now we're doing some marketing coaching um, just to help her, her become a growth practice, basically. So it's super fun. So it's a whole spectrum. Are you getting a lot of, uh, how are you coaching on technology? Some people look at an office, they want to buy an office, they're bummed out because maybe the equipment's old or it's got a pano or it doesn't have this or that. Um, do you think any of these, uh, um, when, when you're analyzing a practice and you're growing, uh, you buy a practice and you start growing, is there any technologies that you think are a return on investment? Yeah, I mean, we definitely look at it as kind of like level one, level two, level three. Um, what Kind of what I, what I teach or preach is scaling up. So I think as new dentists, you know, if you can buy a practice with great numbers in a great location that has potential opportunity, you know, that's where you start. And then from there, you look at it and you say, well, you know, we've got a ton of debt. Let's be smart about it and scale the practice as you grow. You know, I mean, we can, there's certain things we need to invest in right away to create growth, but the rest are kind of icing on the cake, things you can add that then help you gain momentum. So, I mean, you know, as, as millennial dentists buying practices, like I said, we're seeing no digital radiographs. So, I mean, that's a simple no brainer um, online or not online, sorry, uh, digital charting, um, digital practice management systems. Um, two big things that we're doing right away. I mean, those two biggest ROI. And then even patient management systems, we're seeing some good good feedback on things like Lighthouse and Demand Force, um, just being able to communicate and, and fill those hygiene holes with, with technology um, and having getting good ROI back, exactly what you said, is, is really key. So, I mean, digital radiographs, practice management software, that's a no-brainer for sure. The other oh, okay. add-ons, like okay. you said, you said, is crazy. D- digital radiograph. You said that's a no-brainer. As far as practice management software, what do you think? Uh, what which one do you recommend? I mean, there's a lot of them out there. We've used Open Dental, we've used um, Easy Dental and Dexis. Um, we worked with Shine, um, uh, Patterson, EagleSoft. You know, honestly, I I don't think it really matters that much. I think the it's kind of like what do you what do you like to use? They they all do the same thing. I mean. They manage your practice. 
what do you what are you comfortable with? What's what's efficient and cost effective for you? I wouldn't worry about so, it. Too so much. you're agnostic on software, um, are and are you agnostic on which digital X ray system? Yeah, yeah, same thing. I mean, at but, this but, point, the technology. But you called out names. Um, you did like um, Lighthouse and Demand Force. Explain to people who don't know what that is. Um, what uh, what that what is. A patient management software. So patient management software is is an is like an add-on that integrates to your office and your practice management software. So basically it kind of feeds off of all the digital data in your practice management software so that you can communicate with your patients. So we use Lighthouse. I like it, I'm happy with it. It does whatever we need to do with it. There's other interesting programs. Um, I just met with the guys from Weave, which is a really interesting, um, interesting software program. It also integrates with your phone and basically, if someone calls, you know, pops up their name, integrates with your with your chart. It tells you, you know, if, if they have an unscheduled appointment, if their family has an unscheduled appointment. It tells you if they're past due on their recare. It tells you um, when to call them if they're six you know, a month out. It sends them an automatic uh, text reminder, email reminder. So it's a simple simple tool, but we've seen a ton of of value in it. I think in our practice, it's been really important because um, again text message going to a patient, the number one thing they're going to look at, and the number one tool to communicate right now is text message. That's for sure. Yeah, People email, are going to e emails uh, yesterday. I mean, uh, they say 50% um, of emails go into your spam filter anyway. Yeah, so uh, just so if you're driving, uh, light, you mentioned Lighthouse 360. They're at Lighthouse PMG. Lighthouse makes it easy for local business to grow and manage profitable customer relationship through a number. Is it Lighthouse 360? Lighthouse 360, yeah. I'll it looks look it like up. Yeah. In, in different verticals because it looks like they're uh, it's not specific to uh, dental anymore. Or is it? They probably one? it used to be pretty specific. I mean, Demand Force is the one that's the least. Uh, I think they have a lot of different verticals, but Lighthouse Lighthouse was, and they are pretty. I mean, okay. So I retweeted if you're driving offer. in your car. I retweeted the Lighthouse. And, and talk about what, um, the difference between Lighthouse and then talk about Demand Force and Weave. Um, well, demand, yeah, Demand Force is, a, is similar. They're, they're both similar. I mean, honestly, these, these things do the same thing. They communicate to your patients. They give you a dashboard where you can look up who's due, who's past due. You can send out newsletters. Um, you can do email. You can do um, targeted, you know, mass messages. It can do autofill, which is really nice. It's a new tool we had with Lighthouse this last month where if you have a cancellation, you can actually do it. It, it somehow notices that open gap in your hygiene and you can hit a button and it auto texts out 10, I think 10 or so patients to see who are past due to see if they'll fill that. And all they have to do is click C and they're put back in the schedule. So, I mean, that's been the bane for a lot of dentists, I think is unfilled hygiene slots or last minute cancellations. And so, that in itself, I think, has paid for the monthly fee. What do the what is the average fee for Lighthouse Demand Force? No, it, I would say it's like two ninety two ninety nine to four ninety nine a month. Usually, is what I've seen is common. Weave is interesting. I just met with them. Uh, it's interesting. I, I haven't used it, uh, but when I talk to them, the interesting thing is their phone system. So it's basically like if you are updating your phone system and you and you don't have a patient management system, it basically is a two in one. So the phones, the patient management system, they all integrate together as one, one kind of monthly service. Um, and they had some really cool, interesting uh, features with their phone system. It's like if people call, it, it somehow knows the family members that have unscheduled appointments or treatment left over. And so as they call on the phone, it pops it up on your computer on a little bar so you can, when you call or when they call, say, hey, oh, by the way, did little Johnny come in? He's still got that one little filling you need to take care of, um, which it's just, it, it, those systems are great to have in your practice, whether you have, you know, computerized system or not, but it just makes it easier and faster. So that's their, the thing their, with technology. Their Twitter is, uh, their Twitter is GetWeave. I always forget that. GetWeave. Okay. Yeah, GetWeave. Yeah, it's, they're interesting, interesting solutions. Do you guys use anything? We're scheduled 4th of July. I've, I've been on Soft End since 1987, so 30 years I've been on Soft End. And that was the big kahuna back in the day. And um, we're switching uh, July 4th to Open Dental. And open Dental. Because on Dental Town, it seems like um, 
open dental users are raving fans on dental town i mean i just, I just see it um they're growing so fast they're i think they're the only ones that don't even advertise uh, they you don't see them advertising anywhere um i think um it's um uh so we're going to do that then we'll uh add stuff onto it and, and because it is an open system whenever i'm uh traveling around the country and i'll go to like call centers where you know if it rolls over the third or fourth wearing it'll go to a call center they everybody um uh, just says that open dental i mean the whole deal was that it'd be open and integrate easier it's just, it's just so much easier for all those other uh for for that software system yeah. to integrate stuff everything too. else to integrate in. and, and integrators tell me that story every time uh, call centers all say it and in fact some call centers are some big name companies and when they find when when a call comes on <laughs> that the first thing when the phone rings they they yell a profanity word um, <laughs> because it's just uh and, and that that was the, uh, that was the, uh jordan sparks that was this it, the whole deal i mean the whole deal was he had one of the the big uh two and he was trying to export his patients' names and addresses and all that stuff so he could do a direct mail piece. And he found out he not only that he couldn't do it, but they right. had actually gone to great lengths to make sure that he couldn't do it. And he thought, why are you paying people to lock down my data? You know what I mean? Right. So, yeah. Oh, so yeah, he for actually, sure. He was so pissed off. He started Open Dental. Now his brother Nathan runs it. But uh, um, okay, it was so, great. So, so when you're talking about technology for practice management, Lighthouse, Demand Force, Weave, um, any other technologies to help with the business of dentistry? Um, you know, the, the, the phone systems are interesting. I mean, digital phone system, things that you can program, the, the automatic voicemail and um, voice response, those, and definitely rollover. I mean, there's some cool phone, uh, phone options out there. I mean, ours is simple. Digital phone, it rolls over, we get it answered. But, is there any I mean, big, big brand that you recommend? No, not that I have seen. I mean, with what we use works well. Weave is really intriguing to me, and that might be something we'll make a move on in the next couple of years as I see it as I see it play out. But um, you know, the in interesting thing, technology um, that's inside of dental practice. I guess outside and marketing for dental marketing. I think the website, a dental website, is just like it's like low hanging fruit. You know, and that's one thing I coach whenever we work with clients. It's like your website is number one and get invest in a great website, get something built that's, that's user friendly and nice and, and unique. I mean, I think it's so, it's so easy to make a great website and it converts so many patients if you do, if you do it right. And just investing a little bit in your online presence, your, your reviews, um, maybe your Facebook presence just to help express or, or live out or, or show your culture. Um, is a, is a great way to go. And that's just, like I said, low hanging fruit. I mean, that's like, that's like a no brainer. Got to do it. I um, enjoyed your um, podcast with uh, your episode 58 on dentist metrics. Um, is he part of your team on that? Uh, you were episode 58 recreating the patient experience with Dr. Cole Brenny. Um, so, so do you work with dentist metrics too? Well, he, you know, he's, he's one of the online educators, I think in dentistry right now too. And so we're all kind of connected to somewhat, some degree, you know, him and you and Anissa Holmes and Mark Costas and people like that. So we, we we're connected because we just, you know, we're speaking to the same people and we're speaking the same message and we're just trying to help and encourage, um, encourage Dennis and get him, get him some great, great content and connection. So yeah, that's a good one. I like that one. He's a good guy. What about, uh, what about, um, technology to do dentistry you, you talked a lot about technology right. running a dental office on huh? digital radiography um what, what about yep. what about um the, the, all that stuff is for the dry hands uh, up front yeah, what about right. for the wet hands yeah. in the back for the wet hands well here's that's a good question i love there's a couple things that my partner and i um at ivory we we have invested in and just loved i i learned implant dentistry soon off of, after dental school and i um, was mentored or, or learned from Carl Mish. I did his surgical training course and, and loved him. Great guy. Um, and I think the implant systems are, are super easy. I mean, I think getting good training, if, if you have good surgical background, surgical training, get it, get a, get an implant system. It's, it's awesome. And then also endo, my rotary endo and, and my, my gutta core. I love it. I mean, it's like, I just, we did it. We do endos all, all week long. And we, my partner, I come back to the office and it's like, that was really enjoyable. I used to hate endo, um, but it's, it makes it so much more predictable and efficient. It's just super, super nice. I mean, and that's what, number one. Which endo system are you using? 
We, we work with Dent Supply, so we use their uh, Wave 1 system. We just changed over last year, Wave 1 gutta core. And the Wave 1 gutta core combo is like, I mean, we don't have failures, we don't have breakage, they're predictable, they're fast, it's clean, it's patients don't have post-op pain. I mean, it's like, I mean, I'm making it sound better than that, and I get, do not get paid from Dent Supply, uh, but I love it. It's like the one product we look at. What did it's, you switch from when you switched to Dent Supply Wave 1 gutta core? Well, well, my partner, he was working, he was hand filing. Um, and I've worked with wow. the GT. He, yeah, he was hand filing. Uh, my dad still hand files. He refuses. He won't do it. He won't change. But, you know. Really? <laughs> yeah, he won't. I don't know. He, he's, he's old school. He's up in central Minnesota. But he loves it. And he's good at it. So he does it. Um, but we were using the GT files, um, the pro tapers, too, uh, before this, where I was. Uh, but the Wave 1, I just, I love it. The Wave 1 Gold is what we use now, and it's not cheap. I mean, that, and that's the drawback. You kind of look at it, and you're, you wonder, you know, that's the, the question in dentistry. How much do you lean towards the, you know, s- generic brand things to save some money, and then how much is it worth it just to get something that works, that, that's worth it, that can, that can do things predictably in, in, in a way that's quality? Um, and so it's not cheap, but it works really well. Are you looking it up? No, no. Uh, they were uh, Dental Town, Tiny Choice were last year's readers of Dental Town, a publication dedicated to aiding clinicians in practicing high quality dentistry, voted in throngs for their favorite products to help them practice better and safer. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, heartfelt thank to all the customers who voted for uh, these guys. Um, yeah, if, if you're not aware of the Tiny Choice Award, um, the uh, there's a sex zone in Dental Town. Every year we have thousands of dentists vote for their favorite products. And you know, the, the dentists have 8, 10, 12 years of college. They're very anal. They're very paralysis by analysis. <laughs> they don't make quick decisions. And if you're getting beat up on a product, um, you might want to go look at who, which product won. And we also don't just show the winters. We actually show the math. We show the voting. That's a great, because that's some, a great tool. That's, I use it every year. That thing's yeah. off. And your other practice metrics that you put out, what is that? It's like your yearly summary of, of practice state of practice that's a great one too just showing number of days worked and revenues and things like that just to see a ballpark of where other dentists are at it's awesome and and i remember when, when we first started doing it um you know there might be a, a material that you're really having a lot of problems with and then you look at the voting and you're like okay this one won with you know a thousand votes and number two right. was 500 votes and then and then number nine only had three votes and that's the one you're using so then you gotta start <laughs> asking yourself how come a thousand people all become a doctor and you're one of only three out of a thousand using this product so it, it really helped. and then some of the stuff the winners it doesn't matter because like um every year on loops the battle is a, a bloodbath because it's almost a perfect 50 50 tie so the winner will be like 50.3 and the loser will right. be like 59 or 49.7 uh, and they, um, you know, it, it's tough when you, uh, loot, don't win the tiny choice award by three votes. But so, so then, so then you sit there and say, well, it looks like my homies are split 50, 50 between these two brands. And it just, it, I, I try to do it so that you can make uh, faster, easier, quicker decisions. But back, back to endo, um, you know, a lot of times, um, you get, when you're thinking about the overhead of endo, I mean, if, if whatever you're doing makes you hate it and then you don't do it, right. you know, then if, if like, like you don't like lateral hand filing and you don't like lateral condensation. You like uh, engine driven and you like those uh, gutta cores, right? I love it. I yeah, love so, it. So, it, it, I mean, I do it. Not, not many people say, God, I love Indo. I, I know. It's crazy. And I, I didn't. I didn't love it. So, if, if you buy Wave 1 and you start using gutta core and now Indo is tolerable or acceptable or makes you love it well my god the patient wins they don't want to be referred out in different places yeah. and if you're rural they're not going to drive into town um so uh, and win. I, it's yeah. increased revenue your patients are happy you're taking care of them well um you know it's a it, it, that if you're if you're not busy you know and you're worried about getting more patients well just add and you know get good at endo add endo that's going to fill a two hour or hour and a half block in your schedule it was something you would have sent out otherwise um yeah, I think I saw you write something about that. You called endo the low-hanging fruit, like a no-brainer. Like, learn how to do it and do well, something. Do some of it. Well, some some of the things that, um, 
you know, that millennials do that um, seems kind of strange is they're always whining about their $350,000 student loans. They're just always <laughs> whining about that. And then you see them, you know, two years later at a study club and you go, well, how are you doing? And they're all excited. They're like, oh, we just bought a house in Chandler. And I say, how much was the house? And they're like, it was 400. We got a good deal. It's like, oh, so $350,000 student loans to be a doctor. You were about ready to jump out the window. But now 400 to buy a house. And then I'm sitting there thinking, well, why did you buy a house for 400 if you got $350,000 student loans? Why didn't you buy a starter house or live with your parents or stay in an apartment or stay mean and lean? It's not what you make. It's what you consume. Why didn't you keep your costs down? And then a lot of them will come out of school and say, well, I just don't like endo. But I mean, when you look back at our family tree, how many of our parents and grandparents did things they hated for 40 years to put food on the table? I mean, I don't remember a lot of farmers in Kansas saying, yeah, I like working sun up to sundown seven days a week from age 16 till I drop dead. And then they're sitting there, you know, I, I don't I don't like endo, so I won't do it. It's like, well, you know what? Have you ever thought about maybe you should do shit you don't like because the patient's <laughs> in pain and you need the revenue and insurance pays 80% of it. And just because you don't like something doesn't mean that you don't do it. You know? Yeah, I mean, or, 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 I think or, to a certain or degree. you take so many courses on it and you get so damn good at it that you love it. Maybe if you did a thousand molars, you'd love it. Yeah. I mean, I think I, to answer your question or, or, or go alongside that, I think, you know, as new dentists too, I think you're right. Controlling costs is important and, and humbling yourself and stepping out, doing whatever it takes to build your practice is kind of what we need to do. And part of that means help, like you said, helping patients where they're at. If they come in with an endo and you can do it, start doing endo. I, I, I do, I still do some profies. I mean, I have, I built my practice where I had openings and my hygiene was full and I'd say, Hey, put a profi in my schedule. I'm not, a, I'm not above, above getting somebody in to help them out. They don't have to go out two months to, to get and, in. And I mean, a lot, of, a lot of dentists that hire these associates, they'll say, you know, they'll have, they'll have a cancellation of a no show and someone will call in and want a cleaning and they'll say, and the associate's like, well, I'm, I'm not going to do a cleaning. I'm, I'm a doctor. Yeah. It's like, where, no, where that's that common. Yeah. I know. I don't know. I know that is weird. I always, I've heard that too. And, 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 and the, the, the cultures of it, like, like uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, when you, when you graduate from med school, you'll usually work two 24 hour shifts in a hospital. Like you'll work Monday from 6 a.m. all the way till 6 a.m. the next day. And then you come back Thursday and work 6 a.m. till 6 a.m. the next day. And then you ask an associate, it's all whining about their $350,000 student loans. Ah, yes, yes, just whining. And you'll say, well, hey, um, we got an emergency and then come down here right when we close at five and one of the dental assistants will stay with you. Well, I, I'm, I, I'm not staying late. I mean, I, I got stuff to do. I got to meet my husband for sushi and drinks and and rah, 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 and, you, and then then asking them to work one Saturday a month. It's like you're asking them to climb Mount Kilimanjaro barefoot. I mean, <laughs> like Saturday. It's like, come on, man. If you're, you know, every hospital in America is open Christmas, Easter, and Hanukkah. Yeah. No. I mean, it's it's <laughs> we're unique people. Yeah, yeah, and, and that, so that's what I'm telling millennials. Like, if, if you're gonna have a pity party, um, about three hundred fifty thousand dollars debt, maybe you should just hustle. Maybe you should just work as hard as your grandpa did. I mean, think about those stories you hear of your grandma and grandpa back on the farm. I mean, Minnesota winters. What was that like a hundred years ago? Yeah, uphill both ways. It's a blizzard every day. Yeah, so there's just something <laughs> to be. There's just something to be said. I mean, I I can always spot the success when they come out of dental school, just because. That they, they, they hustle. They got to work at it. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know. it's, I mean, you're talking about a really complex issue. It's like, it's easy to hate on millennials and, and, and point everything out. And every generation had their thing. You know, I'm sure when you came out, right? Your parents were like, you, you know, the Woodstock hippies, right? Yeah. The 60s, same thing. So, I mean, it's all, it's maybe it's the same thing, different story, but it's like, I mean, yeah, I think you got to get out, you got to work hard. And you got to have goals. You got to have a, a plan. And I think that's the big thing. It's yeah, get out, work, work hard, help the patient. I mean, you can definitely differentiate yourself from corporate by by really focusing on de delivering great customer service and quality care. So that means yeah, be able to do everything. Have your hours be convenient. You know, get the patient in when they want to get in. I mean, make it convenient to them, and you're gonna your practice is gonna fly, right? I mean, if that's what you're whining about, then go and do those things, right? And, and, that, and you just you just know that the new patient experience it's all of, it's everything it's all about how you make those people feel and 
I can tell you, being a dentist 30 years, that nobody ever remembers who did what in their mouth. I mean, you, right. you could point oh, to no. they don't remember last year. Gold, their only gold crown. You're like, yep. who did that That's gold so crown? True. Like, I don't know. I said, dude, there's only one gold crown in your mouth. <laughs> you, you have no other me, dental. I, I said, were you ever walking down the sidewalk and all of a sudden you got <laughs> knocked over from behind? You, you, you woke up and saw some man running down the street and you had a new gold crown on your tooth? I mean, how, how did someone get in your mouth? And That's place a funny. gold crown, and you have no idea who did that. That was that was one damn good dentist. I mean, talk about. Right. Uh, but so, but they only remember how you make them feel. And right. uh, some of those office, every one of those touch points from answering the phone. Thank you for calling today's dental. This is Valerie. How may I help you? And then how they make them feel when they come in, as opposed to sliding over the, the door, the handing them the, yeah. the the sign in sheet, not making icon. You know, you can just smell. These dental offices, they, they feel like a library and they smell like eugenol and no oh. one ever comes back. And then you walk into the next one and you just walk in and you just feel uh, mm -hmm. connection. You just feel dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin and those are the ones that crush it. And, and you can, the same thing with dental school graduates. Some, some of those dental school graduates, you meet them and they got that whole library thing going, you know. And then you meet these other dentists, and they're they got the um, the warmy, touchy, charisma, whatever. And those guys just crush it, and it doesn't really come down. I mean, that that, that just is such a huge, yeah. important factor of the whole equation. Well, I mean, I think too, you, you have to realize too, like the the when you could graduate from dental school, there's a spot for for a lot of those dentists that are the eugenol, um, you know, not going to push hard because because they're going to go to corporate. You know, they're going to go somewhere and they're going to be happy and content. And they're going to stay there and everything's going to be, you know, safe. And, you know, it's going to be laid out every day. Someone else is going to take care of the business, um, which is fine. I mean, some dentists, that's what they love. So I guess I can't hate on that because some people, that's what they want. And I guess if that's what you want, good for you. But, yeah, if you want to be a practice owner and what you just said is is, is pure wisdom, I mean, you, you can differentiate differentiate yourself very easily by investing in that patient experience. And that's why that podcast with Jonathan was, was great. I got a ton of feedback about that because it's, it's something that you're not taught in dental school. I mean, it's, it's the way to make your practice fly and it's about recreating that experience. I mean, from the point they walk in to when they leave, how does your practice feel? What does it look like? What does it smell like? You know, do you remember your patients? What are they going to say about you when you leave? Are you special? You know, I mean, you have to be unique and special because if you're not, you know, I think I read something, 80% of patients think that dental offices are all the same. So if you can be the 20% in a good way, right, you're going to grow because they're going to send people over. And we see that at Ivory because that's what we're trying to do. And that's what we do is recreate that experience. And, and it's working really well. And we love our patients. They send more people like themselves, which is the goal, right? You build experience, patients you want, they send patients that are like them that you like. You know, you're uh, you're up there in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, my sister's in that nunnery uh, in Lake Elmo for th 35 years. Um, but you're right up the street. You're 45 minutes away from Mayo Clinic. And, and the, I, I, I always wonder why so many dentists don't realize the lessons from Mayo because um, Mayo attracts people from around the world. So does, um, um, so does the Cleveland Clinic. I mean, Cleveland Clinic uh, has over a million followers on Twitter. I mean... You know, with five million followers, you can become the president. I mean, I mean, it's just, uh, it's just <laughs> huge. And it seems like so many dental offices and so many corporates, their their whole branding is, um, you know, cleaning, exam, and X-ray for ninety nine dollars, or buy two get one free. So, so they they're branded as a cheaper, faster, Discount. easier commodity. And then mm -hmm. the problem with that is, when I buy a commodity like, uh, you know, like a bottled water uh i i know what i'm buying but when i walk in there and this dr cole brenny looks at me and says you have four cavities i i don't know if that's true or not i i don't even know what to base that on then and then and then i came in for, because i was you had this 49 dollar cleaning exam and x-ray special now you tell me i have four cavities that are 250 dollars each so it's like oh, okay i get it so i come in for the 50 dollar cleaning and now you tell me a thousand dollars for the cavities and, and and cleveland clinic and mayo clinic and and Sloan and Ketter Feedering and Scripps and San, San Diego. I mean, it just seems like the boys up the street realize that branding trust that you know if you go in there, when you're selling invisible, 
And and these people, I mean, I mean, I was talking to Dennis the other day, his wife's in Colorado, and, and um, she uh, she was so confused about the health care she was getting her doctor there. They moved back to Cleveland so she mm-hmm. could go back to the Cleveland clinic. She's like, you know, I'm I'm a retired woman. I that's the most important thing. I know uh, another friend where uh, the spouse wants to retire back uh, to the country he was born in in Central America, and she's like, I I, I I'm not going to Central America when I'm retiring. I mean, it's, it's all about the healthcare system. And, and here's my doctors, and I don't want to go to doctors uh, in, in the country you were born in. And I always wonder why, um, with uh, trust being, selling the invisible and trust being so important, I wonder why the dentists don't follow the Mayo Clinic up the street from you. What, what's your thoughts on the Mayo Clinic? I mean, I don't know a ton about it besides that it has the reputation of being a great hospital. I mean, my wife, my wife actually worked there for for a year, I believe we, we actually lived in Rochester for a little bit. Um, and, and it's interesting if you want, if we're talking about branding in the Mayo Clinic, the whole culture that they've created, I mean, the whole city of Rochester is Mayo Clinic. So if you've ever been there, it's actually, it's interesting because it's like 45, 50 minutes from Minneapolis and you, you're driving through cornfields and streams and it's like farm country. And then all of a sudden, boom, there's towers and they're the Mayo Clinic and Rochester's there. And it's a pretty healthy, you know, quality city, uh, but everybody works for Mayo and everybody, you know, there's the stories of people. My wife used to work, she's a nurse, she used to work there. And she would talk about, you know, they have certain suites where the sultans would fly in, right? They have the golden toilets or whatever. Um, and so to build that reputation, to be so quality um, and the experience and, and even to work there as an employee. So here's an interesting point tying into that to work there as an employee, they found the best people and they treated them the best and they stay. And so people build families, small town, Minnesota, and they've got a great culture and it's from the bottom up. It's the, it's the image, but it's also the infrastructure, right? The people inside of it are the best people, but they love their job. You know, she, she's had a great manager. She was treated really well. And then that gets out into the world and people come, you know, from Saudi Arabia. So that's my experience. And they, that's what we they, know they here. Open, they, they have a branch down here in uh, Scottsdale, too. Yeah, yeah, they do. I mean, there's uh, I you know, the, the, the metro here is uh, about, about 3.8 million. It's almost 4 million, and uh, it's down in the desert. So there's so many retired people down here. I mean, oh, we call, yeah. we call them snowbirds. It. We're snow. I come down twice a year, visit grandma. Is your grandma, where is she out down here? She's in, uh, she's in Sun City. I'm coming back. I think uh, December and we come back twice here. She's 93 and she's, yeah, we, we went by, she went to the Mayo Clinic last year, you know, so I, t- I totally get it. I've seen it. I've seen the building there. It's, we it's went kind to of Scott funny Hill. because, you know, so, so much of, um, so much of those retirement communities you'd think would be unconstitutional, like to have Sun City, you can't live there in, if you're under 55. Yeah, so so like, 55. I can't move there because I'm 54. But you would think that if you started a business and said you can't, have this business unless you're over you think there'd be some discrimination laws to get that but but they actually love it because <laughs> it's very very stressful for them when they're oh, yeah. three years old and you have teenagers playing basketball on the street next to you and balls oh. going back in your yard and coming in driving in around the night jamming out to your loud music those retirement centers those people and they drive golf carts like their cars oh, oh we drive them around all, that's what we do when we're there we go cruising in the golf cart yeah, it's pretty does fun. She, does she drive it down the streets all the way to the store, a golf cart? No, she doesn't drive anymore, but people drive the golf carts everywhere. That's amazing to me. I mean, we, they're cruising, yeah, to Safeway, and it, they, they, I mean, they go everywhere, to the rec center. Yeah, they're, 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 they're amazing. I love it. I love it down there. So, hey, Arizona, there you go. Yeah. Um, so what, <laughs> what, about, what, what about other technology um, yeah, for the wet hands? You, you talked about Dense Fly Wave 1. Is there any other Oh, things? I got a good one. I mean, this is like a, this is another no brainer. Um, and I don't, I can't, can't even practice. Well, I, I have to use VPS if I, if I have to, um, but digital, digital dentistry scanning, um, scanning, it's like, it's the only way to go. I mean, I started, um, right out of school doing, doing CEREC and not that I'm a strictly Serona guy, but, um, it's been what I've used and I, and it's consistent and it's, it's, quality for me, but my patients have loved it. Um, the quality is there scanning and milling, uh, for sure. At least scanning is, is definitely a no brainer. I mean, you that's find like yourself scanning or scanning and milling. 
I skin it. Well, it depends what I'm making. I mean, I don't, I have an older unit. So speaking of saving money, um, one of the recommendations I have too, for, for young dentists, if you're starting to practice, um, you know, I bought the blue cam used on eBay and I bought the milling unit used on eBay and I've had it now for four years and it, you know, I bought it for 30,000, I think. I can't remember something, something significantly less than a new one. And what would a new one have great. cost? I think at the time they were 90,000, Yeah, you know, right. 90,000. Right. So, I mean, it does, you know, I could have bought the new Omnicam at the time, but I wasn't really sold on, on the updates. It was a flashy new thing. And so buying technology like that, sometimes if you can get it used, it's a great buy. I've paid that off, you know, times over now. And I use a blue cam, Cerec milling unit for my single unit crowns. Emacs is great. Um, occasionally I'll scan and send out for a Bruxer, um, or, a, you know, some sort of zirconia crown, um, VPS I'm still using for bridges or anterior, some cosmetic cases, um, because I haven't upgraded my camera yet. Um, but that's the next thing we're actually, my partner and I are talking about the next investment once the full arch scanning and <laughs> upgrading our, our, our scanning unit, maybe this next year. And what do you, what do you think you'll upgrade it to? Well, I don't know. We're we're deciding now. You know, there's Omnicam. I've heard great things about Itero. I've seen I've seen really good really good feedback about Itero. Um, we just talked. We had a meeting with one of the labs. We did a had a CE event and a pretty big lab here in in Minneapolis in the cities. And we asked to him, well, what do you see? What do you see coming back from Dennis? What What do you like best? Or what do you see people are using best? Um, and he he liked Itero, but he also liked um, what was the other one? Itero, Sarah, trios, trios. the trio. It was the trios. Out of yeah. uh, Copenhagen. He really liked the trios. Yeah. Well, you're like, you're the right. Trios. There were 3M is they, they got the true definition yeah. scanner. Have you, they do, they do. It's, it's, it's just been, I looked at it and it's just too clunky for me. You know, the thing that gets me with these, with these scanning units, which I hope we can change someday is the data fees. I mean, it's just, that's the silly thing to me. It's like, just take a scan and then have to pay you money to email it to somebody. I mean, you know, like you, you talked about open dental and, and I love, I love Samsung. I love Android because it's open, right? You plug something in, I can send things back and forth. Um, you know, why can't we just do that with these files? I mean, we, that's the thing. Let's buy the tech and just send it. I don't well, like I mean, the it's, it's the, it's the whole Steve. I mean, I mean, both there's pros and cons to everything. I mean, you, you can't say this is perfect. This is bad. Like, like Microsoft's open. Uh, but, uh, all the hackers know that, um, Apple yeah, right. is closed and that's why the hackers don't play there. Um, there's pros and cons to everything. Um, what's the name of the big lab in, in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, twin cities, twin cities, dental lab, twin cities, dental lab. Yeah. That was um, the mat, the lab that I spoke with about this. You know, that's a um, profound advice for young kids. Hell, hell, all kids. I mean, you're sitting there, you're a dentist, and you're thinking about buying a scanner, and you know, it just it's just the obvious thing to go down to your lab and talk to the uh, lab man and see. You know, I mean, he's getting scans from everyone, and I also um, I also think for the young kids. Um, I I think when you're the, the first several years out of school, I don't know if you're good enough to put your uh, impression in a box and mail it uh, to a different city far, far away because you need a mentor. And the oh, fastest yeah. way you need to come back. The fastest way to get really, really good on Crown and Bridge is when you're talking to the lab man. Or I, I guess with iPhones and FaceTime and how we're Skyping or whatever. But when you go down to the lab, there's a couple of things that's interesting. You know, the, this person you're talking to, you might be 24 and the lab man you're talking to, maybe he's done this for 24 years. And he can show you all the pans coming in and the pros and cons. And, and then a lot of times they can fix up the mentor. Like they'll say, you know, you ought to go visit so-and-so. Then they'll call him on the phone and say, I got a young dentist here. And uh, would you mind if she came by? Because she's got all these questions about impression. She's having difficulty taking impression, blah, blah, blah. But um, gosh, uh, work your value chain. Yeah. When we, when we do our, our new dentist events, part of the, the topics we cover in the lecture is, is communicating with your lab or, or your expert team. And one of the things I talk about is uh, as a new dentist, I use my, I use technology a lot. So when I have a lab person, what I recommend new dentists do is get their name, right? Get their numbers, their cell numbers, or get some sort of number. And I will actually take 
pictures of my cases, right? So every, every case I'll send, I'll take a picture with my phone and I have a note phone, so I've got a pen. So I can actually take a picture and up front, even of the patient and the tooth, and I can actually draw right on the screen, right? And then I email them or I text it, I email it usually to them and the lab will get a picture of what I'm working on. And they love that. When a lab can get somebody to send them an actual picture um, to help out with a case and then give them feedback. So then, then we'll go back and forth and they'll say, well, what do you think about this? And they'll show me a picture before they send it back. Um, so that, that sort of communication you, using this technology we have available now, I, for me, has been priceless. It's been great. I think my lab loves it. I mean, maybe I bug them too much, but at least, at least they get it right, you know, and I don't send it back. But that's been huge. Using yeah. technology to communicate. Now, is that the lab you use? That that. Uh, That's one of one of them. Yeah. Because one pe- of them. People are always looking for labs. Um, why, why, why? Yeah, you, yeah. Why, why do you use them? Um, what, what what labs do you use and why? I like I like them because um, they're they're local and I have the guy's name right. I, I know the implant guy. I know my ceramic guy. Joel Richardson. Um, removable guy. No, that's not the. That's not my. That's not who works on the. On my. That, that's the person on my contact. Yeah. Yeah. But they, um, I know them, I email them. They know me, they know I'm going to send them an email. They know, you know, if I, if they can, I can communicate with them the way I want to communicate. Um, and, and it's, it's helped a ton. Um, there's a local guy here who does, um, ceramics, really, really quality ceramic work. So I've got kind of specialty ceramic. Um, um, and then also I use Glidewell. I like Glidewell for, for some simple key things. I mean, the night guards and bike guards I got back from them, they're solid, you know? They're cheap and they work they, very well. They do 5% of the dental industry uh, crown and bridge. One in every 20 crowns is made at Glenville. <laughs> I can't believe it. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a huge that, place. I mean, it's just incomprehensible. It's crazy. One I mean, in it's, every 20 okay. crowns. Where are they located? Is that ca- California? Uh, Southern Cal. Southern Cal, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and Micro Dental, too, is another big one, too, but... Um, yeah, they're pretty good too. And, and I, I love the CEO, uh, Jim Glidewell. Um, you know, when you know, in the last thirty years, so many people have taken so many pot shots that you know they're the cheap lab, the cheap lab, the cheap lab. And you know, it's guys like that that realize that you know not everybody is rich in America and go to a dentist that uses a lab that costs. I mean, yeah, some of them are one hundred fifty units, some are three fifty a unit, and it just seems like whenever you um, go after the poor. In dentistry, you're, you're, you're cheap or you're low quality. And he's, I think he's extremely, um, works very, very hard to make it uh, faster, easier, lower cost. I mean, there, there's, there's lab guys uh, around here that are still at 350 a unit. And, but they're working with high-end prosthodontists and rich Scottsdale. Right. And there, there's a market for a Mercedes Benz. But You're I not going to send your PPO patient to the yeah, yeah and that's yeah. another thing. So, so then, so then they'll what do you do? Someone will send them a PPO. It says sign up for a forty percent reduction on your fee, and it's like okay. So are you going to yeah. do it forty percent faster? You could do everything the same instead of scheduling an hour and a half for a crown. Are you going to schedule one hour for a crown? You can knock that whole baby out, seat them, yeah. numb them uh, while it's numbing, pack the cord, prep it. Uh, then make the temporary with your assistant. You know, you can make a, a four-handed uh, temporary in two or three minutes. Uh, then impress while well, it's impressing uh, with three mm per gum. Go do a hygiene check. Come back. Check it with your lubes. Put on temporary. Are you gonna, are you going to go faster? They're like, oh no, I'm still going to block an hour and a half. I'm just going to do it for a forty percent lower fee, and I'm going to use the same <laughs> lab that's charging right. one seventy five a unit. It's like, dude. If, if everyone could do that, then tomorrow United Airlines would just lower their prices lower than Southwest, who's the number one, 27% of the market. Well, if United just lowered their fees to beat Southwest, they'd, they'd be insolvent in 30, 60, 90 days. Right. Yeah. I mean, being smart, you have to be tactical every decision you make, right? I mean, that's it. So um, are, is, that's are you on. coaching? Is there any uh, CPA that you work with closely or on your students? Or, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. So that's one of the things um, we definitely go through in the steps is just developing, I call it the expert network. So, because that's the thing, as a new dentist, we get out and um, we don't know, we don't know anything about who we should use to help us. You know, it's like we get a recommendation from our supplier and then maybe from somebody else. Um, and so it's interesting, there's no, there's no kind of accountability between the, the industry people helping dentists. So actually, that's one thing I did in Minnesota is I started doing a 
kind of a almost like your your dental town county choice. We do um, the expert network kind of ratings here, and so I'll put out a guide every year about who the top attorney, dental attorney is, the dental CPA, um, brokers, and lenders, and make sure and kind of vet them, make sure there are people helping out um, dentists in the industry and have a good reputation. So yeah, we definitely, that's important to build that network. So you have those people, but. So you have um, all those contacts? That's a problem. Yeah, I do. So uh, are those on, if they go to your website, practicingdentist.com, is that there? Or do you want them to email sure. uh, you Dr. Brennan yeah, at practicingdentist.com? If there's any questions, yeah, everyone just go to the website, practicingdentist.com, email me at drbrenny at practicingdentist.com. Um, that is on that that guide is online. It's on it's on my my new dentist course website. So there's a login to get into that. Um, but yeah, if they want if they're new dentist listening and you didn't get access to that, maybe you missed the the RSVP. It's a whole course I built specific for graduating dental students entering private practice. I've got a book. I've got a a guide how to do hygiene in private practice. Um, I've got the expert list if you're in Minnesota. Is I've the got book that. on I've Amazon? Got, it is. Yeah. What, what it's the, on Amazon, but you can download it for free on my website. So just do that. And what's the name of the book? It's A Dentist's Guide to Life After Dental School. Nice. The, do you see that on the bottom of my of the Practicing Dentist site? Yes. It's on the very bottom. There's two books, and there's one that's for new dentists, and then there's a Launch, which is Launch, Buy, Build, Grow. That's for new dentists that want to learn how to get into practice. Who's on the cover of that? Who's, whose face is that? Um, I don't know. I wish I could make something up, but. So that was just a stock image it's, of a model a or something? Image. Yeah. It, yeah. I should say that as somebody I know, I should have come up with a better story. Um, but yeah, that's just a guy. That's just a guy. We'll call him a dentist trying to start his own practice. Joe. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. Well, yeah, um, no, I, you know, and another thing you could do, you could start a, uh, you could start a thread on, um, uh, Dental Town has 50 categories, and one of them is um, dental students, one's um, uh, practice management. I would go in there, and they, they would think it was spam if you go in there and say, hey, go to my site and all yeah, this. But I if you start the thread and say, I just did a podcast with Howard, and he told me to go list those on because these people are commuting, and uh, I, yeah. I think it'd be great marketing. There's uh, Under practice yeah, manager, sure. there's ask a dental consultant. There's uh, ideas to make your practice grow. Yeah, go go to the podcast because uh, you you have a, an amazing podcast. Everybody should hear it. Um, even Thank even uh, old guys uh, that need to fix up their <laughs> practice to get it in selling mode. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, uh, I mean that's that's actually yeah part of the part of the time we talk with older dentists that then are wondering what what younger dentists are going to want. You know what how, what they should invest in. So yeah, no, I appreciate. It. I I love it. I I mean you got a lot of great info. I've been on Dental Town since they started. So you're a pioneer. It's an honor. Uh, it's, it's an honor that yeah. you came on my show, and uh, I love it when other pod um, podcasters uh, start uploading the deal. It's all about, um, you know, no one reads one dental magazine. No one listens to yeah. one podcast. Um, people think in uh -huh. fear and scarcity. It's like I've never met any patient where I was their only dentist, and they'd never seen anyone else before or after me. I've never yeah. uh, met one dentist who only read one magazine or one podcast. It's all about just sharing. It's all about our sovereign profession. And I think guys like you are what I call one of the thousand points of light in dentistry. And hey, uh, so uh, thank you for all that you do for dentistry. Thanks for uh, starting the practicing dentist.com. Thanks for starting a podcast. And uh, I hope you have a rocket. And next time you're down visiting grandma, if you want to come by and have a beer, eat some Mexican food, we'll take grandma out drinking. How old hey, is she? Hey, you, she's 93. 93, that's she's, a one beer woman. She's up for it though. She's intense. <laughs> hey, you better be careful though. When I come down, I might I might actually show up on your doorstep. You never uh, know. Hey, anytime, any day, brother. I'll do it. I'll All be right. back this winter. I'll come bring grandma on the golf cart. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great day.